lift off to the southwest corner of South Island, New Zealand. Here, the ancient glaciers and their meltwaters have sculpted a landscape so rugged and impenetrable that it still preserves remnants of the island's original life forms. Following the old river courses, the glaciers carved out huge troughs in the earth. In the east, they formed lakes, while in the west, they were flooded by the sea, creating fjords. Fjordland is where Operation Rally will spend the coming spring. This is not the story of those taking part in the expedition. It's a record of the world they found waiting for. It's mid-September, high up above the tree line. This is the last of the true snowstorms before the spring thaw. As the sun climbs higher, it brings spring, and the snow begins to melt. Small avalanches are triggered off by the recent storm and a change in the temperature. The snow mounds up at the foot of the cliffs. Running water from above melts the snow from below, creating tunnels and weird caverns. As the ice and snow melt, a flow of water begins. It will pass through the Fjordland countryside, run into the fjords, and so become the sea. The days lengthen and new growth appears. Alpine herbs like the giant buttercup have adapted to flowering over the short spring by producing their buds the previous autumn. As specialized pollinating insects like bees are rare in these highlands, the work is carried out by flies and alpine moths. Herbs survive the harsh climate sheltered between grasses. The tussock grasses clothe huge expanses of subalpine highland. And it's here the flightless and critically endangered Takahi spends the warmer months. The bird spends 90% of its day feeding. Once a piece of grass is selected, it nips it off at the bottom. Holding it in one foot, it meticulously strips off the outer cover of the stem until it gets to the nutritious inner pith. Unfortunately for the Takahi, larger animals share its preference for these tender grasses. In the 1960s, exotic wapiti and red deer were released here for hunting. They bred rapidly. Now, there's a lot less grassland. The Takahi just could not compete. As the tussock disappeared, so did the Takahi. But today, a high proportion of deer are captured live for venison farms, and it keeps the numbers down. Captive breeding programs for the Takahi, together with this scheme for deer removal, have saved the bird from extinction. Others are also dependent on these grasses. The alpine grasshopper crushes the seeds with its mandibles. The blood-sucking sandfly is a continual source of annoyance. For persistent flies, the hopper has developed a simple deterrent. Between the upper limits of the bush line and the bare rock lives the mountain parrot, or kia. With its strong hooked beak, 
It rips up pieces of moss and lichen to find the larvae of alpine beetles. With the coming of spring, love is in the air. Often the male has more than one mate. However, this male is more easily contented. Soon, this pair will nest in a burrow high up on the rock face. The snow and rock give way to a vast evergreen mantle. This is rainforest, where silver and red beech trees predominate. In the spring, the beech prepares to flower. Its tiny red buds attract birds. In the tops of the trees, yellow-crowned parakeets feed on the fresh growth. The spring blossoms draw honey-eaters like the bellbird, which sips the nectar. Below the dense canopy of the forest, it's a darkened world, pierced only by shafts of light. Life is sheltered here, protected from the harsh sun, wind and driving rain. Moisture and warmth are conserved. The amount of light governs which plants can survive. Ferns, the green hood orchid, moss which is a well-stocked pantry for this bush robin. Unlike most of the world's forests, here the chief predators are birds. If you're slow and flightless, disguise is vital if you're to avoid being eaten. The spiny stick insect has mastered this technique. The forest can withstand the presence of leaf-eating insects. Their numbers are carefully controlled by the birds and by other predators who lie motionless in wait. This is the tree gecko. Intruders are having a disastrous effect on the order of things here. Red deer are drastically thinning out the luxuriance of the forest's understory, reducing it to the barren sand. Westerly winds sweep off the Tasman Sea, pushing air streams against the mountains of Fjordland. It rains up to 250 days of the year. It's one of the wettest places on Earth. Suddenly, as the storm started, it stops. The sun begins to coax out the moisture from the forest. Mountain walls are transformed by cascading veils of water and the runoff towards the valleys begins. Some of the water disappears from the outside world into a belt of limestone underground. Here, the process of erosion is still very much alive, so this part of the cave is young and developing. Close by remain ancient passages carved out by the water's previous course. Deeper in the system lie eerie galleries, abandoned by the ice and rushing waters for a hundred thousand years. Now the water only drips, laden with limestone, piling up stalagmites on the floor. 
and hanging stalactites from the roof. When the water trickles along a slanted ceiling, other weird and wonderful shapes grow, slowly, over thousands of years. Towards the mouth of the cave, fine silk threads coated with sticky globules gently blow in the draught. They belong to the lava of the fungus gnat, which uses the lines to snare its prey. But here it's caught a moth, which is over ten times the size of the lava's usual victims. The moth will remain suspended, uneaten, until it rots off. This is the almost transparent predator. It's repairing its nest, an important and never-ending chore. Small false entrances to the caves act like natural museums. They exhibit relics of the ancient Maori peoples who sheltered here on their hunting trips from the north. It was the Maori who hunted the now extinct giant moa bird. Its bones still litter the cave floor. The tribes worshipped the gods who created Fiordland, and here they paid their final respects. These are the desiccated remains of a Māori princess. Buried, sitting like this, and uniquely preserved for over 300 years. At the bottom of the cave system, the water emerges out of the darkness and re-enters the forest. The river holds the forest back and this encourages the growth of smaller sun-loving plants. Unlike most of the ferns, the elegant tree fern grows in sun and shade. New leaves are produced at the top. When they die off, the base of the old leaf remains, so the trunk grows. Strange-looking lichens carpet the stony riverbank. With its feet, the Red Admiral Butterfly tastes the sugar of flowering scab weeds. It uses its long, slender proboscis rather like a straw to drink the nectar. Extending and retracting it by combining a muscular action with blood pressure. The koai tree also prefers the sunny edge of the forest, and over a few days in spring it bursts into brilliant blossom. These huge baskets of flowers provide a feast for the honey eaters. The tui proclaims this new found larder with one of the most complex songs of the fjordland bush. Its brush-like tongue enables it to extract the nectar with ease. In return, the tui is helpful to the tree. As it feeds, yellow pollen collects on its flat head. It carries the pollen to the next flower where it rubs off as the bird feeds. And so the tree is pollinated. Smaller pollinators are at work too. The European honeybee was introduced for richer honey. It overwhelmed the primitive native bees. There's a glut of potential honey here, so much pollen that this bee's judgment appears to have been affected. It's overladen and begins to lose control. The waters leave the forest and flow into wide glaciated valleys. Rock debris eroded from the mountains collects as shingle beds, laced with river channels. Home for many water birds, each with its own feeding technique. The banded dotterel scurries over the shingle, pausing every few yards to look for movement. The long, flattened bill of the South Island oyster catcher is an ideal worm probe.
The stilt wades in the water and scoops its food off the surface. Black-billed gulls stir up the bottom with their feet and pounce on whatever they disturb. In springtime, the gulls migrate here from the coast to breed on the shingle beds. They nest in large, crowded colonies. After three weeks incubation, life in the outside world is about to start. For others, it's already begun. Over the next few days, hundreds of babies will hatch. For the moment, life is orderly in the colony. But within a fortnight, the chicks will begin to walk and become extremely active. When three chicks find themselves in the same nest and all have different parents, the squabbling starts. Within minutes, the colony is in disarray. In the mad confusion, the chicks run in all directions, stabbed at by hundreds of vicious beaks. These early days are the hardest in the chick's life. The chicks eventually find sanctuary by grouping together in large nurseries. The parents recognize their own by the sound of its call. With peace restored, there's only one further problem for the chick. And that's how to get mother to bring up the breakfast. In mid-spring, waves of colorful lupins swamp the valley floor. They're beautiful, but these imported weeds are a threat to the native plants. They completely cover the banks, smothering everything else. The water channels unite to form larger rivers which flow out of the valleys into the lakes and fjords. Sheltered by the surrounding mountains, the water is as smooth as a mirror. The water is deeper here, so the bird life changes. Like most aquatic birds, the shag is protected by a dense plumage, which it waterproofs with oil from its extra-large preen glands. The little scorp duck is an excellent diver. It can dive to a depth of more than 30 feet, where it forages for insects and plants. It uses its feet for propulsion and as a rudder. Shortly before dusk, a paradise duck leads her young family out onto the lake. Here, using their instinct and with the help of mother, the chicks must learn how to eat.
night brings a renewed attack on the beech trees. The brush-tailed opossum was released by man into Fjordland as a lucrative source of fur, but it's caused considerable damage to plant life. Its large claws and prehensile tail enable it to climb along the thin outermost branches to reach the buds. However, this young opossum still hasn't mastered the art of balance. But through trial and error, it reaches the juicy shoots. Underneath the beach, another creature of the night is out, the flightless kiwi. Its mate has also emerged from its burrow. While foraging for food, the kiwi must drink regularly to clear its long bill and snout of sand. As dawn approaches, the pair reunite and retreat back underground. The fjords lead out to sea and the meltwaters of spring begin the last stage of their journey into the ocean. The waves, pounding against the exposed headland, eat away at the weaker rock. When the tip is more resistant than the rest of the headland, it begins to get cut off as the softer rock behind it erodes. In time, the original tip separates from the land and minute island stacks are formed. A narrow girdle of rough sea is an effective barrier against predators like stoats and rats, which is why, on these isolated outcrops of rock, a very rare reptile has survived. It's the Fjordland skink, and it's found nowhere else. Its sense of sight and smell are acute. An incautious worm reveals its presence. The skink smells and detects its prey with its tongue. It must eat quickly or be robbed by its neighbors. Inevitably, large meals are shared. A skink's jaws can only move vertically, so it has to wedge in the last mouthful with the help of the rock. The waters off Western Fjordland are cold and supply a rich variety of food for the New Zealand fur seal. By late spring, breeding colonies are well established on the coast. The larger bulls have fought for their own territories and each has rounded up a harem of up to 20 females, already very pregnant. So by the end of spring, the pups are over a month old. The young suckle for nearly eight months and will remain close to their mothers until next year's pups are born. The 
boulder-strewn beaches mix with coastal scrub. And between the rocks and clumps of flax is the breeding ground of Fiordland's most comical resident. The chicks of the crested penguin differ markedly from their handsome parents. Yellow crests and bright markings help them to recognize their own kind in the water. The male fasts for a month, guarding the chick, while the female spends all her time in the sea catching its food. The chick spends the entire day eagerly awaiting the return of mother. From the sea, the journey home is long and cluttered with obstacles. Constantly, there are important decisions to be made. The chick doesn't need much persuading to receive a mouthful of regurgitated squid and fish. Its appetite is overwhelming. So is the noise. It's probably earned a good scolding from both parents. Within the neighborhood, a hierarchy tends to develop among the adult birds. Some give the orders, and some take them. Isolation is the great protector of life on these remote coasts. Despite man's impact on New Zealand, Fiordland is relatively unspoiled and one of the world's last great wilderness areas. At the end of summer, the seals and penguins will leave to winter at sea. But with spring, they'll be back to a safe environment. Today, that puts them among the privileged few.